great. So I think we're going to start. Um, I'm sure people will be milling in and out, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to, um, first of all, introduce myself. I'm um, Pamela Stone. I'm on the faculty here at Hampshire College um, currently. And I am also the director of the Culture, Brain, and Development program here at Hampshire College. Um, I'm going to start out in sort of a reverse order by thanking everyone, since some of you may not stay till the end of the film, which is perfectly fine. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. I think this is um, wonderful that you all came out. Um, I want to thank our co-sponsors for this event. Um, so they co-sponsored us, the Massachusetts Myelogic, um, I always mess this up, en Encephalomyelitis Chronic Fatigue and Fibromyalgia Association, as well as the Five College Culture Health and Science Program. Um, they all, tons and tons of support to bring this here. Um, and there's also been countless others throughout the five colleges that have helped with outreach to bring people here and to share this event. Um, I want to make really special thank you to Rivka. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know where she gets all her energy, but she has been the heartbeat of this. She has supported this entire event from beginning to end. Um, constant emails, phone calls, texts. I can't even begin to tell you. I don't think I could have done this without her. She is amazing. Thank and you. And she is also one of our panelists. Um, and I also want to thank the rest of our panelists. Um, Dr. Lynch is here. And I'm going to introduce everyone when we get to the panel, but I just really quickly, um, I want to thank him for his time. Talk a little louder. People in the Sorry. I got a mic. <laughs> yeah, this is a mic. Um, I want to thank Dr. Lynch for his time for coming and joining us, and to Ashley um, Haugen. Am I saying that right? Excellent. <laughs> um, she's a Hampshire alum. She was my Division Three student. I claim you. You are mine. <laughs> um, and you're going to hear her story. But she's the one that also resulted in this event happening here today. Um, if it weren't for her and for tuning me into the world. Um, of seeing families who struggle with this and people who struggle with um, all different types of chronic diseases, but ME in particular, um, we wouldn't have had this event here today. And I think we wouldn't have had um, the acknowledgement of it. And on top of that, her father, Dr. Ron Davis, is a tireless researcher and advocate for this um, illness and his commitment to find an answer, or at least to find a way to bring people back from the clutches of Emmy and to live their lives. I just, I can't express how much thank you guys for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so as I noted, um, this event wouldn't have happened without Ashley. And, and after watching Unrest, um, after she told me about the film, and then inviting me to an event just like this at Cooley Dickinson, I realized that it was really important to bring this to a college environment. I've had students come and talk to me about being sick and me thinking, you look all right. I, I don't understand. What do you mean you can't get out of bed? It's really hard to understand something like this when you're not struggling with it or you're not working with a family member or someone dear to you that's sick. And um, I've also heard my colleagues struggle with trying to understand this. And I just think that um, it's so important that we have this moment to think about this and hopefully you guys will take this with you and share with other people, particularly people that may not have thought um, this might touch their lives. In addition, I do want to say we are filming today and there will be a link to all the discussions. We're not going to film the film, but there'll be a link to all the discussions at some point, um, both on the Massachusetts MECSF um, site as well as um, the CBD site. We'll get that put up at Hampshire College. Um, so if you know anyone that wants to hear what went on and couldn't get out of bed or couldn't make it for whatever reason, um, it'll be accessible to those people. I also want to let you know that the film has closed captions for anyone that needs that as well. Um, so a little quick bit about our um, schedule tonight. We're going to um, hear from Rivka for a couple minutes. Um, she's going to set the context of MECSF. And then we're going to screen about 23 minutes of the film to really sort of get into the conversation about this um, and to set the framework of the illness. And then Dr. Davis is going to come and share recent research. And then each of the panelists will talk briefly about their experiences with ME and CS. CFS, sorry. Um, and after that, we'll have a question and answer period. And then the goal is to 
show the rest of the film starting around 7 p.m. And I recognize that some of you may want to leave at that point. You're welcome to do so. But we're, I'm going to be here watching the rest of the film, and I would encourage you to stay and watch it with us. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Rivka and let her. Thank you. Do the rest. And do you want me to? So you can just hit this button. You got your first okay. slides up. Uh, this is your second. Okay. Slide. You know what? I need my glasses. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Pam, and thank you to everyone at Hampshire for welcoming us. It's really, really wonderful to be here. And as Pam said, it's really important for us to bring this information to colleges and universities because a lot of us patients with ME um, got this right around your ages. So it's really important for us to bring this information uh, to college campuses. So with that... Um, my, so I'm Rivka Solomon. I'm with the Massachusetts ME, CFS, and FM Association. That stands for Massachusetts Myalgic Encephalomyelitis slash Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Fibromyalgia Association. It's a mouthful. Um, let's see, what did I want to say? We have uh, been advocating for this disease for almost 30 years, and the disease has been in the shadows uh, for about 30 years, and you'll hear more about that as we progress tonight. Um, but then in 2015, something shifted, and the disease became more, came more to light and became more legitimized in the eyes of the medical establishment, and that was when the Institute of Medicine came out with a report. The Institute of Medicine is now called the National Academy of Medicine. And they said a lot in that report, but we distilled it down to five key facts. Number one, their primary message of the IOM report was that MECFS is a serious, chronic, complex, systematic disease that frequently and dramatically limits the activities of affected patients. Number two, it is uh, very infrequently taught in medical schools, about a third of medical schools, and that translates to that most doctors know nothing about the disease. And that brings us to number three, that many healthcare providers are skeptical about the seriousness of the disease. In fact, they, some, many of them do not believe that it's real, and they dismiss patients. And number four, worse than dismissing patients, many medical professionals have hostile attitudes towards patients and to suggest to them treatment strategies that actually hurt them. And that brings us to the last one, which is that the Institute of Medicine said that there's remarkably little research funding on this disease and that much more is needed. Some key facts about the disease. One to two and a half million Americans have it, including me. And I'm going to actually put this down. Okay. Uh, 70, no, there we go. 75% uh, are women. 70% can't work. 25% are homebound or bedbound. There's no diagnostic test, no FDA approved treatment, no cure. Symptoms will persist for years. Recovery is rare. Very few of us have been diagnosed, and many of us have been misdiagnosed. There's only a handful of medical experts nationally for up to two and a half million patients. ME costs the economy 17 to 24 million billion, with a B, billion dollars annually. And NIH research is so minuscule that you can barely see that tiny little line, uh, the, the, far the far right line. Uh, we get about five to six million dollars a year historically. Last year it got bumped up a little bit, but not much. Um, the organization that I'm with, the Massachusetts ME, CFS, and FM Association, we go by Mass ME, and we focus on education, patient support, and advocacy, like events like this. And with that, I'd like to introduce the film Unrest. It won a Sundance Film Festival Award, a Boston Globe Film Festival Award. It was shortlisted for an Oscar. It aired on PBS, uh, Independent Lens. It's available on Netflix and lots of other online streaming. And the most important thing that I can say, if there are any uh, healthcare professionals in the audience, are there any healthcare professionals here? Great, thank you, thank you, great. 
uh, by watching this film at the uh, website, the URL that you see there, you can get continuing medical education credits for it. So we hope that people do. And now, without further ado, I'd like to present Unrest, the film that's changing the world for MECFS. Okay, so that was the first 23 minutes of unrest, and it's just as, the rest of it is just as powerful. So we hope that you will stay after uh, the panel and watch the rest of the film, and if you don't, it's on Netflix and every other streaming, online streaming uh, platform. So, to summarize, uh, what you just saw is um, people struggling, living with MECFS. It's an acquired chronic multisystemic disease characterized by significant relapse after any physical, cognitive, or emotional exertion of any sort. The disease um, impacts the immune, neurological, and energy metabolism systems. The cog there's cognitive impairment, sleep abnormalities, autonomic dysfunction, and uh, it results in significant functional impairment accompanied by a pathological level of fatigue. And by that they mean severe fatigue. Um, uh, the, other, the, the two biggest takeaways that I want people to uh, leave with are the last two bullets. This is not a psychological disease, it's not a psychiatric disease, and it's not quote unquote just fatigue. Um, there's a host of very, very scary symptoms that come with the disease, and you'll hear more about that when you hear the patient stories. And Pam, take it away. So, so I'm not really taking away. I'm just going to introduce um, Professor Ron Davis to come and talk to us. Um, he comes from the West Coast, so he came out all the way for this to talk to us. He's the director of the Stanford Genome Technology Center and a professor of biochemistry and genetics. His research and publications span 50 years with accolades from all over the world. Um, his teaching brings his own research into the classroom and offers students an opportunity to consider intersections of research and lived experience, illness, and the pursuit of wellness. I hope I captured your course this semester well. <laughs> um, his current work is focused on trying to find scientific answers to save his son from this devastating disease and he joined the Open Medicine Foundation and is the director of the Scientific Advisory Board to do this research in hopes of finding a diagnostic biomarker and effective treatment for MECS CFS patients. Um, he has the long-term goal of finding a cure. I could talk for hours about all the things he's done and what an amazing guy he is, but I'm going to turn it over to him and just thank him so much for coming, and he's going to talk a little bit about the current research. No, it, it messed it up when, so hold on. Okay, yeah. that's fine. I'll come uh, uh, this is a picture of, <clears throat> of my son, and I wanted to show it because. Uh, Did you move the mic up? Let's see if that, does that work? Uh, he's a, a severe case, and I wanted to show people how severe this gets because almost never, nobody ever sees this thing, including doctors, uh, because they simply can't go to a hospital, and they can't see doctors. Now, we're lucky to live in the Bay Area, Area, and uh, in that situation, I've been able to get doctors to come to him, and he's had a number of really excellent doctors that try to help him. Uh, and you, you can see that he's pretty emaciated, and that's because he has a lot of digestive problems. He can't really digest food well. So in his current state, and he's been like this for you know, four or five years now, um, he, he cannot talk, he cannot listen to words, he cannot see words, he cannot see letters, he cannot see numbers. Uh, they cause excruciating pain if he were to look at a number. Uh, so we cannot uh, talk to him. Uh, he cannot swallow, so he's fed with a port in his chest that goes into his heart for, for saline, and he cannot digest food, so we have a port into the top of his intestine where we put pre-digested food. 
And so he stays in this state all day. Uh, he is very imaginative. And so he's, uh, what we think is that he spends his time thinking about past experiences, and that's how he survives. Um, and so this, this is not an uncommon state. This is not, oh, this is just a rare example. Something else must be also wrong. No, probably around a third of the patients are severe. Uh, and they're bedridden. And if they're lucky enough to have a caregiver, uh, the, the caregiver takes care of them. And they can get this bad. There's another person close by that we also look at that is also almost in the exact same state. The saving grace in my son's case is that he's not light sensitive. He's super sound sensitive. You put, uh, we don't have it in this picture because uh, nobody's in his room, but he uses uh, these uh, uh, cancel noise cancellation headphones that you wear when you work around a gen engine. So it totally blocks out the sound, but in fact, he can still, has enough sensitivity, he can still hear things. He can hear us whispering outside his door with the door closed with those on. And so uh, we cannot talk around his room. Uh, but he's not light sensitive, and that's kind of a mystery. The other patient that we know that lives close by um, is very light sensitive and has to be in a completely dark room, which has got to make it very difficult to take care of. Uh, he is, however, able to talk a little bit. So they come in different uh, uh, gradations. So. Um, I just wanted to share that to show that this thing can be really, really bad. Because uh, there's so many patients uh, and so many doctors that say, well, it's just not that bad. It's, it, this is like one of the worst diseases you can get. And as far as we know, everybody can get this. And it comes after a stressor. And that stressor could be commonly an infection of some kind, which you can't easily protect yourself from. It can also be caused by an auto accident. It can be caused by a childbirth. Um, and so anything that causes a stress, a physical or mental stress, can cause the disease. And once it happens, the chances of you getting over it are very, very slim. So we'd love for NIH to step up to the plate and actually try to fund research for this, and so far they've been very unwilling to do that. And it's mostly because in order to do that, they would have to take money away from some other disease that's better understood. So they don't like it that this disease, well, what are you going to do? We don't understand this disease. <laughs> That's your responsibility. Figure out what you have to do to get research started. Well, that, that's what I'm doing. I wrote three grants to NIH all turned down because uh, there's not enough known. Uh, so our big effort is massive data collection on the patients. Uh, we decided to look at severe patients. Uh, and we've collected a massive amount of, of information on those patients, and are it's going to take years to go through and analyze all that data. Um, meanwhile, we've put up all the data we have on a website where every researcher in the world can look at the data. They don't have to do ex necessarily experiments. Um, and, and we're trying to crank out some publications, although that's not our highest priority. Um, this is just a slide uh, that uh, Ripka made. Uh, um, uh, it shows all the different systems. So a lot of things, it's a very <laughs> systemic disease. Many people are focused on the brain. Yeah, it's affected because the brain's complicated. <laughs> and I'm sure there's things in the brain that are affected. But it affects the gut as well. It affects digestion. It affects all the muscles. So it, it's a very systemic disease. <laughs> so the, in, the, in the work, what we're doing is looking at the symptoms and trying to come up with some idea of how we could treat that. Um, and the other thing that we're looking at is can we build a diagnostic marker? And uh, we're trying very hard to get a good diagnostic marker. Uh, <clears throat> so what we're looking at are some of the symptoms, and can we make them in a way, in a molecular sort of way, that would work as a diagnostic. So what we have found is that if you take blood cells and you stress them, and we stress them with just salt, that their electrical impedance will change dramatically. Healthy cells don't do that. And that happens with every, every CF patient that we've tried, and we've never seen it in a healthy control. So if it's flipped down, sorry. So we've been using that system 
uh, to see if we can find a drug. And we put drugs in and then stress the cells and see if they respond. Uh, we're encouraged because we found two things so far that will seem to work. I'm not telling you what they are because I don't want patients to try it yet. Because uh, <laughs> uh, they will, no matter what it is, no how hard it is to find. Uh, I've learned that patients will, will find something in China or they'll find it in India and have it shipped to them and they'll try it. And uh, so uh, I, would, I don't want to harm them. And so I want to make sure that it's not dangerous. And, um, uh, but, but we're trying to look at existing drugs and, uh, because we don't require then FDA approval. If we develop a new drug, it'll probably take 20 years. And it will take 20 years and $500 million. I don't want to wait that long and I have no idea how to get that much money. <laughs> so uh, we're trying existing drugs or, or uh, herbal type uh, remedies that are allowed to be used. Um, so that's one effort. That's possibly just to treat the symptoms. That's okay. Uh, we have another marker which looks at the red blood cells. Turns out red blood cells are not as deformable in these patients. It may account for some of the blood flow problems they have or the lack of oxygen, we don't know. But it shows up in all the patients so far. Uh, the nice thing about the blood flow is we can develop a very, very simple little device to measure that that can be run in a doctor's office. So most of our technology is nanofabricated and is always handheld. And so uh, these could be put in doctor's offices. And we have a few other types of technologies we're looking at as well. <clears throat> but what we really like to do is to find a cure. Now, when I tell that to physicians, they usually tell me that, no, no, we don't cure diseases, we treat them. Well, that's because, it, as a physician, you want to help the patient as soon as you can. So what you look at are symptoms, and that you find a way to treat the symptom, and that doesn't cure them. So uh, we need to find the cause and, and then try to cure them. And we have one model that is, does make a great deal of sense, we have, now what you have to do in science, you can't prove something is correct, you have to disprove it. So we have to show that we're wrong. So far we have been unable to do that, but we have to keep trying. Uh, it's fundamental, it would explain almost all of the symptoms, and it's a simple thing that happens to patients, and we call it a metabolic trap. It has to do with the understanding of the biochemistry that goes on in the body, and you can get yourself into, uh, an, uh, there's a normal state, and then there's that abnormal state. If you get into this, this is just pure biochemistry, that's what I do. If you get into this abnormal state, you cannot get out of it. Now there may be rare instances that would get you out of it, but they're very, would be very, very, very rare. And that doesn't account, that doesn't say people couldn't get better. The nice thing about that is the fact, if it's true, we can probably figure a way biochemically to push them out of that abnormal state. So that's where most of our effort goes right now, is to figure out, is this correct or not? And this is an example of incredible frustration. This is typical of all research. Uh, you get a critical sample, and it goes to the mass spectrometer. That, now we're going to find out if it's right or not. And the mass spectrometer breaks. <laughs> and it takes a week to get it fixed. And that happens over and over and over again, of just little trivial problems that keep you from from really t critically testing it. Uh, we've just discovered that probably the way people grow cells in culture for the last 70 years is wrong. And, and that's one of the problems that we're currently having. We probably have to change that. To try to change it, we could not find a single reagent uh, for doing this in the United States. And we found it, finally found it in, in, in Germany, and we now have it. I don't give in the details, because that's just an awful lot of complex biochemistry. <laughs> um, but I want to give you the kind of the feeling here, and that is, I think if you can figure out the cause, you can cure it. Now, we, there is examples of that. If you get a bacterial infection, the in cause is the infection. We understand that, and you cure it by getting rid of the bacteria using antibiotics. So there are good examples, if you understand the cause, you can actually cure it. And I think medicine should go in that direction. This is a prime example, maybe we can do that. So this explains a, a, a very chronic disease, and, and it's an incredibly awful disease. And you, you should really hope that you never get this. But it's about 1% of the population has it. So the probability you get it is not vanishingly small. 
and we need to put pressure on our federal government and the CDC to step up to the plate and do their job. And their job is helping people and, and funding research to find causes and cures. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to introduce um, each of the panelists individually, have them give a little um, bit about where they come in, and then we're going to open it up to questions from everybody for a little while. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Lynch. Are you ready? Are you <laughs> available? Um, um, Dr. Lynch is a local physician, and he's board certified in family practice and integrative medicine in Northampton. And he specializes in chronic illness and supports patients with ME, CF, CFS. And I heard you said for the last 14 years you've been doing this work. Um, and he's going to talk to us today a little bit about um, diagnosis, management, and treatments that he supports. And do you have a slide? Sorry, I missed up this, this one. This one? Yeah. Yeah, it was okay. the one. Thank you. Thank you all for your help. Oh, it's wonderful seeing you all here tonight. So I am uh, a community physician. That's how I'd always define myself. I am boarded in family practice, and uh, my introduction to uh, MECFS is about 14 years ago when I took my current job, where I was introduced to it by patients, not by curriculum, not by a physician, not by a medical school, and certainly not by a residency. Uh, most of my peers know nothing about how to treat this disorder. So I'm definitely one of very few who are uh, who have some understanding about how to how to uh, evaluate this. Before we get to treatment, which I'd be happy to talk more about in um, in the uh, question and answer session, let's go over a little bit about what's how do you actually define somebody who has this uh, unfortunate condition. So the Institute of Medicine, which is uh, failed medicine in many ways, but uh, uh, but in a fortunate moment, actually put together. A, a very nice uh, categorization of criteria here. Uh, as Rivka mentioned, this really pushed forward uh, um, acceptance, I would say, at least to some extent by some of my peers. I would only say to some extent. But, uh, but they listed the core criteria, which was very important because, again, you're, you're, you're vetting this illness from a, a, a central government sort of organization looking and saying that there are, are identifiable criteria that this is more than just fatigue. So as, as listed here, core criteria, impaired function accompanied by fatigue persisting greater than six months. Uh, and this is not mildly impaired function, as you saw in the movie, as uh, Dr. Davis described his son. Uh, these are p uh, patients who are disabled. Uh, Post-exertion malaise is, is a, uh, this one I, I was probably one I learned early on, that uh, patients would tell me that their trials of uh, exercise, which we'd encourage them to do in our silliness when we were first learning about this illness, we just encouraged them to keep pushing through it, uh, of course backfired because they get this post-exertion malaise where they exceeded what was in their energy envelope and then got worse. So we've learned from our mistakes and realized that, that pushing and, and trying hard and gutting it out really doesn't work well in this disorder. And, and the other core criteria of the three that are required for this diagnosis is unrefreshing sleep. So these are folks who uh, wake up just as tired, if not more, than when they went to bed, even if it was 12 hours ago. And the last two, uh, the either or or both of these, uh, of the fourth and fifth criteria here are, are probably among the most disabling. I mentioned the fatigue being disabling, but, but I think the cognitive impairment and or orthostatic intolerance are uh, among the most severe and disabling symptoms that we see and, and also the most challenging to treat. Uh, though we've had uh, more, maybe some more recent luck with treating orthostatic intolerance and we'll, we can talk about that more in question and answer. 
Um, but these are all very profound symptoms and profoundly affected folks. As you see th that we go through all five of those criteria, not anywhere is mentioned anything about mood, not anything. So there is no psychiatric criteria that are indicated for this illness. Uh, there uh, certainly, uh, it has no place uh, to, to diagnose this illness uh, at all. And, and that's not just for me, but that's from the Institute of Medicine. And it mentions other symptoms, chronic pain, immune and infection manifestations, which are just about every patient. And we talked to, and the other slide went through some of the other uh, issues. Okay, so basic clinical management. So someone presents to me, a new patient I'm seeing just now, and they come in with a diagnosis of MECFS. Uh, my first approach to them is to tell them that I am not going to judge their illness, that they do not have to defend it, not in front of me, that I don't have to, they don't have to feel like they have to fight for the existence of their illness in my space. So if you can do just number one, you are better than most of my peers. Just that, just listen. And then we get to the stuff that requires a little bit more of a degree. <laughs> Uh, so assessing support needs, this falls to most of my staff, uh, shelter food, social work accommodations, disability assistance devices, and uh, helping caregivers. Uh, these are uh, folks who have a lot of needs, some of which are medical, uh, a lot of which are, are filling out forms, helping with disability, uh, working on uh, um, shower seat, working on a powered wheelchair. So this requires uh, time. Unfortunately, in my, in my practice, we have uh, enough nursing help to to uh, give some support to this end, which is perhaps more important for a lot of patients than what they get from me, um, as far as my good and usually not so good ideas on how to treat them. Uh, number three, education about pacing. So, so I mentioned before that, that you cannot push uh, folks uh, over, uh, because you always do push them over when you try to encourage them to do more and more and more. Uh, the idea of pacing is important, that, that you understand that, that uh, that uh, you have to let the patient lead and believe them when they tell you what their limitations are. And this, in red, it's, it's very interesting because there, there were some older and now, uh, fortunately, um, uh, revoked uh, um, articles about, about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and graded exercise therapy being the only uh, uh, tr treatments that were of any worth. And, and, and those articles have since been discredited, so these are not acceptable treatments and, and only harmful for patients with MECFS, and I uh, would extend my apologies to any patient that I've ever uh, proposed this to, but that's been many, many years, thankfully. Uh, number four, um, there are symptomatic supports which can help, uh, and maybe more of, maybe not as many of the very severe symptoms, but we have had some success, so we'll talk more about this uh, in, in question and answer, and I'd be happy to take any questions on this, but, but helping with sleep, helping with uh, orthostatic intolerance, trying to support uh, pain, uh, you can get somewhere with, with these treatments. Uh, we've certainly seen it. Uh, doesn't mean we're uh, breaking new, new ground with this, but there are, some, most patients have some, uh, some patients have some level of improvement with, with symptomatic treatments. And, um, Let's see, and then beyond the basics, uh, disease experts have had success in improving function, decreasing symptoms. So immune modulators for us have definitely been helpful. We've definitely seen help with, in some patients with antiviral treatments. Uh, we've definitely seen uh, benefits in, with some of our colleagues at the, at the Brigham in treating POTS. That can have a life-changing effect on some patients as well. Again, unfortunately, symptomatic treatment rather than curing treatments, but uh, we'll take what we can at this point. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, next, I'm gonna ask Ashley to come up and talk. Ashley is a Hampshire College alum. Um, I was her Division Three chair, as I mentioned before. Um, and I'm gonna tell you what her Division Three was about, <laughs> or at least the title. It was called Medical Pluralism in Healthcare in Guatemala, Integrating Bio and Ethnomedicine in a Modernizing Traditional Culture. And 
She's currently the director of events and marketing for the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Research Center at Stanford University and the Open Medicine Foundation. Um, and Ashley is a primary caregiver for her brother, Whitney. Um, and I wanted to invite her up to talk about being a primary caregiver and her experiences both with Whitney before and after um, his illness took hold of him. Yep. You can sit there if you want. It's your, come up here. <laughs> I had to do it to you. <laughs> Hello. Um, so uh, my brother is currently 35. He first got sick when he was 23. So that's about 12 years. Um, he's been bedbound for six of those years living with my parents. Uh, he's currently, I don't know. he's currently completely bedbound. He's unable to speak. Um, he's unable to tolerate any type of sound any type of touch, any movement. He can't get out of bed. Um, I haven't, we haven't hugged him in four years. Um, we can't even hold his hand. He just cannot tolerate any kind of interaction. When we walk in his room, he has to wear a hat to cover his eye line so that you, he can't even see you moving inside of the room because he can't tolerate processing movement. Um, and sound is definitely the worst. Before my brother got sick, though, he was a professional photographer. Um, he won awards for his photography. He traveled all over the world. He lived in India for a year. Um, he studied photography at Bennington College in Vermont. Um, he was just full of energy. And you hear that a lot with these patients. They say, oh, well, I was a backpacker, or um, I ran marathons, or I was a professional weightlifter. A lot of these patients were completely more than healthy, on the go, active people. Um, and you don't hear about a lot of patients that weren't very energetic type A human beings before they got sick. Um, I don't know why that is. But um, he started to get sick after he lived in India and he just slowly got worse and worse and worse. And uh, he was in a wheelchair for a while and then he was finally unable to move around in the wheelchair and became completely bedbound six years ago. Um, we used to blend up his food and bring it to him in a cup, you know, blended up chicken. It was really gross. Um, and then he stopped being able to swallow. So for a while we had him on TPN, which I don't know if you guys know what that is, but uh, it's a line that goes directly into your heart and you just give the person direct nutrients. And this is used for very short-term care it's only supposed to use, be used for two to four months, and my brother was on it for years. Um, that's why he looks so emaciated in that photo, because he hadn't eaten in years. And when you get that direct line of nutrition, it's just not the same. Uh, the doctor finally said we had to transition him off, because he was going to go into organ failure if he stayed on the TPN. Um, so now he's tube-fed through a uh, tube in his intestine. His stomach doesn't function, and he's unable to swallow, so he can't have a tube into his stomach it goes directly into his intestine. So now that's how we feed him. Um, and he's gained some weight. So he looks a little bit better now than he does in that photo, but um, at his lightest, my brother is 6'3", and he weighed 130 pounds. Um, so that's how much I weigh, and I'm 5'4". Um, probably shouldn't tell everybody how much I weigh, but um, <laughs> just for comparison, he's about a foot taller than me. So it was shocking to see him. Just complete skin and bones. He looked like he just got out of a prisoner of war camp or something. Um, so he's a little bit heavier now. He might weigh 150, 160. He's still incredibly skinny because, you know, it's not enough nutrients for his body. Um, but he's, you know, a little bit, I guess, better, <laughs> but really only in weight. Um, so it's a full-time job taking care of him. My mom had to quit her job. Um, when I first graduated from Hampshire, I moved back home and I took care of him full time so that my parents could still work. Uh, it was a very overwhelming experience and we decided that it was time that I started my own career. So my mom took over and she quit her job to do that. And it's, a, it's literally 24 seven. He's up off until six o'clock in the morning and they're in and out of his room, bringing him things that he needs, switching his medicine. They're just, they're up all night long. Um, it's a huge job for caretakers. 
And a lot of it is not supported by insurance because it's not a you know real disease. Um, I did people go bankrupt. There's a lot of people with this disease that are homeless because they don't have families that can take them in or they don't have families that will acknowledge that they're really sick. And I know a lot of people whose entire families abandoned them because they wouldn't suck it up and get better. And they wouldn't go see a therapist because they were convinced it was depression. Um, my brother saw a therapist because he said, fine, maybe you're right. <laughs> maybe I am just depressed, I'll go to therapy. Um, of course, the therapist said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not depressed. You're sick. And send them home, because they can't, there's nothing to treat there. Um, so it really just affects more than the one to two million people that we suspect are, are sick, because entire families are just ruined by this disease. And I, I also think more than that number is actually sick, because so many people go undiagnosed. So I think my dad says, you know, it could be more like five million or four million, because we just have no idea how to calculate that number. So do you have any questions or anything? Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Um, next, Rivka, do you want to sit or do you want to I'll come? I'll stay here. Okay, so Rivka's going to um, share with you some of her experiences, and she's also going to share with you the story of a former Hampshire student um, who wrote to her when they found out that we were doing this event and wanted to share, but they couldn't be here physically either. Um, so Rivka, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pam. Um, so first of all, I just want to say before I forget that this disease is a spectrum. Can people hear me? This disease is a spectrum. So some people um, can get through the day at work, and then they come home and they collapse, and they need the weekends to recover. Other people are as severe as you've been hearing about tonight. So I just want to make sure people understand that this is a spectrum. Um, OK, so first I want to read um, a short piece from Walker Stores, who uh, went to school here. Um, my name is Walker Stores. I attended Hampshire College studying music photog and photography from 2013 to, to 2017. In the summer of 2016, I contracted Lyme disease and was treated for it, but had lingering symptoms. I continued to worsen throughout the preceding school year, but I tried, but I tried to push through. By the fall of 2017, my symptoms were bad enough that I couldn't go back to school, despite being one semester away from finishing my Div 3 and graduating. That winter, I was diagnosed with ME-CFS. Since then, I've gotten progressively worse. Now I am severely ill. I'm bedbound and can't even listen to music, let alone play guitar. I'm in intense pain and suffer bouts of being in a catatonic state sometimes unable to speak or even turn over in bed. Be before becoming sick, I was looking forward to the rest of my life. Soon I would graduate and pursue what I loved most, creating music and art. Now I'm unlikely to ever get a chance to do those things, unless something drastically changes, as currently most people with severe ME never fully recover. Contrary to the cliche, this illness hasn't given me strength or taught me anything valuable besides that things can always be worse and that there are infinite shades of pain. Many people consider this illness to, to be not as serious as others because it's often not terminal, but this is not living. This is a living death. If you want to reach Walker, he said that I could share his email address. I think he'd be happy to hear from people. Um, you can ask me again for it later if you can't write it down now. It's Walker Stores, S -T Walker Stores, S T O R Z, at yahoo.com. So that's Walker's story. Um, my story is that um, when I was 21, I was in college with two uh, of my housemates slash roommates, and we all got mono at the same time. And they got better in about a month, month and a half, and I essentially never got better. And I'm 56 now. Um, the way it played out for me was that I was so sick with mono, uh, even after it showed up, stopped showing up in my blood tests, I was so sick I could barely stand up and brush my teeth. This went on for a full year. I was bedridden for a full year. After a year, I spontaneously recovered 
enough that I could go back to school, travel, exercise, but I was always still exhausted all the time, but I could push through. Well, that only lasted for a few years because seven years later I got a cold and the cold turned into bronchitis and that turned into walking pneumonia. So my second big infection, the first one was mono, the second one was walking pneumonia and the illness ME just came roaring back like a freight train and ran me over and threw me back in bed and I've been tethered to my bed ever since and that was 28 years ago. So it's a total of 29 years that I've been sick. Um, the symptoms I experience are really, really scary. You're seeing me right now on a good night and even on a good night, it's hard to explain what I'm going through right now. I'm utterly and completely exhausted. My brain's not functioning and I feel like I could collapse at any second. That's what's happening right now. Um, and that's always happening. Um, I'm often too weak to function at all. Some days just getting from my bed to the bathroom is more than I can do and I have to use a wheelchair. I have non-restorative sleep. My brain is a foggy mess. Uh, that's why I need these notes. On good days, you might see me get to Whole Foods, uh, but I might pay for that afterwards. I have that PEM, post-exertional malaise, or what patients call post-exertional uh, crash, uh, where I can't function then for uh, days or hours. Um, the scariest part of this disease is that I am now experiencing the type of paralysis that you've heard others experience. My body just stops working. I can't move my muscles and I never know how long that's gonna last, and sometimes I feel like I'm going to die, literally, like my body is shutting down. The hardest part of this disease is that the symptoms are completely unpredictable. I have no clue when they're gonna start and when they're gonna go away after they've started, and the weirdest part of this disease is, look at me, I look fine. Uh, people don't get it, uh, they think I'm not, being honest, I'm somehow faking it. It's maybe a psychological disease, but that's not true. Make no mistake about it. Uh, ME means experiencing a devastating loss of just about everything. Many, many patients lose the support of their friends and their families. This family that you see here is extraordinary and very unusual. Um, most families, unfortunately, have drunk the Kool-Aid that this is not a real disease and it's psychological and they've abandoned um, their loved ones with, with the disease to care for themselves. So I feel very, very lucky that I found a really wonderful doctor and Dr. Lynch and um, many uh, people do not find healthcare providers uh, across the country. There's um, a dearth of, of physicians that understand the disease or even believe it. So when Dr. Lynch said, if you come to me, you don't have to defend yourself. I felt like crying when I heard that. Um, if that were only true for the up to two and a half million people with this disease in the country, instead they have to fight. They have to fight just to be believed. That's it. Thank you. So now we're gonna open it up to questions. Does anyone have a question? Please. He's asking about the um, overlapping um, s fibromyalgia and, um, and ME, and I didn't hear what the... What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, I can answer a little bit. You probably can do more medical. Uh, I, I, my guess is they're, they're the same thing. Uh, I think fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, chronic Lyme disease, Gulf War syndrome, uh, PANS are probably all the same thing. Uh, the difference might very well be uh, the susceptibility to that particular disease in that individual patient, it may having to do with their genetics or something. So it, re it expresses itself a little differently. So fibromyalgia has pain, chronic fatigue syndrome has pain, but it isn't the most uh, outstanding problem that they face. It's more cognitive and, and, and uh, uh, energy levels. So. Uh, I think they present just a little bit, but I suspect it's exactly the same thing. 
Other questions? Well, yes. Can yeah. we, can we oh, answer oh, sorry. that too? I'll, take, I'll, I'll, take, I'm a, sorry. I'll take a stab at that too. Yeah. So I agree 100% uh, with Dr. Uh, Dr. Davis has a thought here that, that these are a spectrum, you know, they're, they're the same. And, the, and I think studies that have looked at overlap with just diagnostic criteria, 75% or excess, uh, people can have one or both uh, within them. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think of them as separate disorders. I agree with, I agree with that. Um, the, the idea of pain uh, with fibro patients, there, there, there are, stepping over to the treatment part just to treat pain, there, there have been studies, and one has been done at Stanford, uh, looking at, at different modalities that can help, particularly for pain with fibromyalgia. One of the things that we use in my office is something called low-dose naltrexone. Dr. Davis was talking about using old medicines uh, to try to look for cures. Well, here's one of them. This is naltrexone, which is a medicine used for addictions. Uh, but used in a fractional dose, and this is the genius of a Dr. Bihari uh, in New York City who did this research, but, but it's using a fractional dose instead of 50 or uh, 100 milligrams three times a day, which you use for addicts. If you use a fractional dose, three or four and a half milligrams at bedtime, this medicine has an immune redirecting, I would say, effect, uh, endorphin release, which seems to help de down regulate some of the inflammation and induces some of this pain. So there are parts of fibromyalgia that I'd say that um, had more success with treating than maybe some of the worst parts. But, but, the, but I think the question of, of are they this, you know, uh, is there really a distinction between them is probably n not. Can I, I'd like to weigh in on that. So I have a different take on this just to add to your confusion. Um, so I have friends with fibromyalgia who've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia and they can exercise. If I exercise, in fact, exercise helps them. If I exercise, it's not pretty. I will be sick for a very, very long time. So in my opinion, there's some differences. Now, it might be that there's some kind of underlining um, cause and, uh, and that each person, it manifests a little bit differently. Um, but in my experience, they, 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 they look different in people. However, you can have ME, CFS, and have fibromyalgia as a comorbid condition. Now, the other thing I'll mention about that is I don't have very much pain. And fi one of the defining characteristics of fibromyalgia is pain. I've been diagnosed with ME. Um, by the way, I just want to say something about the name, M-E-C-F-S. Um, some people call it M-E. The patients uh, tend to call it M-E more than C-F-S. The government is now calling it MECFS, so that's sort of what we're settling on. I just wanted to make sure everybody understands when we talk about ME and we talk about CFS, we're sort of talking about the same disease. Um, but the last thing I'll say about the difference between fibromyalgia and ME is that because the government has not been funding research, that's why we don't know if they're the same disease or if they're different. My wife has had MECFS for 39 years. Um, she is a patient of Dr. Lynch who talked earlier. I agree with what you said earlier about the fact that this, this is a spectrum disease. She is not as serious as your son Whitney, but she is worse off than, than you are, Rika, in that if she gets out, She had sent me with a specific question. As I mentioned, she suffered from CFS for 39 years. She is thrilled that I am seeing Dr. Davis. We followed you online for years and applaud your efforts in this. Uh, her disease has progressed slowly over time. She had it when we met. At that point, it would be like a flu-like symptom for a week or so, then she would be fine for a few months, then it would come back. Now it's the opposite. She has it all the time. She's bed bound some days. If, she, if some days she can get around in a power wheelchair or even walk around the house, but rarely does she leave the house. She had two questions, which she's a great organizer. This one is for you, Dr. Davis. Do you think that a severely ill patient will need a different treatment protocol versus one with moderate forms of disease? 
And do you see any metabolomic differences in stages of these diseases? Can you repeat that last bit? Let's so it's on the, the tape. Uh, the question, one of the questions was to uh, uh, the severely ill patients. The severely ill patient have, have a different treatment protocol versus one with moderate forms of the disease. Let's start with that. Uh, well, my, we have so little treatment um, that's effective. Uh, my guess is that they'll be the same, but the severe patients will be dip, more difficult. Um, and they may have more things wrong with them. And as a result of that, it may, it, it, one treatment uh, that seems to work on one patient may not work on them because they have other things that are masking it. So it, it makes, it's probably gonna be a nightmare for uh, physicians to treat them. Uh, is because there's so many things wrong with them. Uh, the, uh, the physicians, I think, are very heroic who actually tried to do this. Um, uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, ultimately finding something that will work, um, I, I'm, I'm suspicious that it's all the same thing. And uh, why they get into different states is, uh, you know, that is one of the issues that we're trying to use in our modeling. Um, the modeling we do is all mathematical. Uh, and uh, it's done by Robert Fair, who's a, uh, a graduate from MIT in electrical engineering, and uh, he does m medical modeling. Uh, it's essential to do that, because that, we can then uh, make a lot of predictions from that. And what we're looking for, can we understand, even if our ideas are wrong, uh, we, we focus on can we predict a lot of the things. And one of them is severity. And the model predicts you'll get different levels of severity. Okay. And, um, and do you see any meta metabolomic differences at different stages of disease? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the, Can you repeat uh, the question? The, the question is do you see uh, differences in the metabolites? So the metabolites that are in your plasma, uh, are all the things that you eat to get digested, they go into your bloodstream, and then you're, they're absorbed by your cells. Uh, also, what's in the blood are all the waste products. So you, you need to think about the blood as being the staff of life and also your sewer. And um, so it makes it a little more difficult. Are the things we're seeing are part of the necessary for life or is it part of the sewage? And um, what we'd like to look at are the cells. Technologically, that's extremely difficult to do. Um, uh, and we're going to, we are starting to do that, but th that will give us a lot better understanding. But we'll probably have to get better methodology to do it. Uh, but yes, they are. Uh, uh, in my son's case, about one third of the metabolites are more than two standard deviations below healthy control. And some, one, one of his metabolites is 16 standard deviations below a healthy control. There's another component that we found in all the severe patients. Uh, that is a neuroprotectant, and it's missing. We can't detect it in the blood. And so uh, that, that some of that can explain the level of severity. Why the metabolism changes, we don't have a good idea. And it's a new field, because the technology has just become available to do that in the last few years. So we don't have, uh, and I, I, uh, I do all mine with a company that's in, um, North Carolina. Um, my son's sample was the first one they ran. <coughs> and uh, they were shocked <laughs> and realized this is a business <laughs> because it's so informative. And they have built a business out of it. And they're automating all of it and trying to reduce the cost. But we don't have a lot of other uh, examples. We don't have a lot of other diseases. What do they look like to try to tease it apart? So yeah, there's a big difference. Uh, second question. I don't need to hog the time, but my wife, this is wanted to get these two questions. Does anybody on the panel or in the audience have suggestions for at-home assistance with both preventative medical care as well as other chronic illness problems other than ME-CFS? You mean home health aids? Yes. Do you want to answer that? Suggestions for home assistance for both preventative medical care as well as other chronic illness problems other than ME-CFS. And then she says, how does one manage the medical arena with this disease, with this disease from one's bed? That's the big problem she has. Is we've, we've seen a bunch of doctors. A lot of them don't even believe this disease exists. Um, and, and managing, is there, are there any resources to manage 
resources that are out there to help with this issue. Uh, Sue? Yes, could I, I would Can you talk really loud, though? Yeah, sure. Um, I am a nurse and a psychotherapist. I work 12 years in home health. My daughter is, has been ill for four years. Um, she has been bed bound for two. Um, we have identified a very experienced physical therapist um, who's going to come in and help regarding safety issues. Um, she has POTS. Um, this therapist is very excited about doing this. In fact, on a state level, we're looking for you know, to put together some protocol. Um, most insurance will, most insurance companies will cover for at least initial safety visits from PT, for sure for physical therapy. And nursing might be able to come as well. Um, so we're just, just beginning to look at that, but it's a crucial missing piece. Your, your wife is totally right. Yeah, helping manage all the components. And then from the home. You're so sick, it's hard to even deal with it. But then you yeah. start to deal so with it. so sick, the same thing can't get you the gun at all. That's right. So right. I think one of the things to do is to stay in touch with the Mass Association, too, because they have a lot of resources for this. Um, yeah, excellent. And and just so you guys know, there are a lot of resources on the back table, too, for everybody that wants it. And I don't want to cut this short, but I feel like there's a lot of hands up. And yes, I think I that, yeah. That. I just yeah. want to make one note about what uh, the question is. How do you get help in your home when you have this disease? My father has Parkinson's, and he has so much help at home. And I, I and other patients have a real hard time getting help at home. Many of us can't physically get to a doctor's office. And uh, we're up the creek without a, a paddle, honestly, until we get telemedicine um, in, this, in this state. And um, there was one more point I wanted to make. Uh, well, when I was bedridden and unable to function at all about two years ago, I couldn't get a nurse to come and do a blood draw in my home because I hadn't been to the hospital. I couldn't go to the hospital. I knew going to the hospital would be a disaster for me. In fact, a study just came out saying that people with ME-CFS, um, I don't know what word to use, we abhor going to the hospital because we are treated so disrespectfully and disbelieved. Um, anyway, the point is, your wife is not alone in her struggle. This is a key element. If anyone is wealthy in this uh, room and wants to donate to an effort to try to change this, we would love to hear from you. Um, up here. Yeah. Uh, I'll come uh, this question isn't really from Walker so much as it is kind of on behalf of Walker. Uh, he's quite convinced that uh, craniocervical instability has a major role in the cause of this disease. And kind of wondering what you all think of that hypothesis and what craniocervical instability means to you. Ron, do you want to take that or do you want I can do part of it. Okay. Um, we work with a physician at, uh, uh, in the Bay Area, uh, David Kaufman. Uh, he comes to all of our research meetings, and his, also his colleague, uh, Ch Chetta, comes to our meetings. Um, he is the physician who had the patient that uh, had the fusion in the, uh, in the spine. In the technical terms, I'm not going to be able to do. Um, and who feels that he, uh, that person got better. Um, I think that's probably uh, what happens is the, the, the head drops down too far. And, uh, and the spine sort of penetrates into the brain and probably cause a, a lot of problems. Uh, that's probably caused by Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, as our guess. Uh, I'm walking with a cane because I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and my knees are totally wearing out, but I don't want to take the time to get them replaced. Um, <clears throat> so what fraction have it? I asked David about that. He says, uh, he says, I don't think that's the cause of the disease but I think it adds to a lot of the symptoms. And uh, what fraction of the people have that? Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's evaluated a, a, a number of other people who he's pretty convinced of do not have that problem, uh, although they could develop it because of the flexibility problems. Uh, our assessment is about half of the patients have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, 
so, uh, so it's a uh, it, it's some for some reason it's causing a connection with the with the disease and that's also possible that they develop Ehlers Danlos syndrome because of the disease um, we don't know that for sure so I just want to clarify what the question is the question is is there a brain stem compression issue basically yeah. and um, and the answer is we don't know and we don't know what percentage of the patients might have this. Um, Jen Brea, who you see in the film, just had the surgery to relieve the brainstem compression issue, and it will take a number of months before she sees, you know, how how she does. And this is something that our community is now exploring. But every few years, something sweeps the community, and we're convinced that it's X, Y, or Z. And many of us run off and try to do those treatments, and some of us get better, and some of us don't. And that's how it shakes out. I've read that if you, this is directed to Dr. Davis, I've read that if you take a normal muscle cell and expose it to the serum of a person that has MECFS, that muscle cell becomes abnormal. And also, if you take a person with uh, uh, MECFS, if you take their muscle cell, and expose it to normal serum, that muscle cell normalizes. So that suggests to me that the etiology, that the pathogenic agent is within the serum. And rather than get into metabolites and biomarkers at the moment, I'm just wondering if something like plasmapheresis to filter and replace serum uh, done slowly, done in small amounts, not like in a poison center, but done slowly in small amounts so you don't uh, affect the blood pressure. Do you think plasmapheresis would have a role in the treatment considering those findings? Um, so the question is uh, really about uh, 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 plasmapheresis, that there may be something in the plasma. We, we agree that there probably is uh, when we do this assay with the impedance assay and we take uh, uh, the plasmas required to that assay to work and the cells are required for that assay to work. If we take uh, uh, disease cells and put in healthy plasma, we don't see the signal. We take uh, healthy cells and put in chronic fatigue syndrome plasma, we do see the signal. Now the question is, what is it? <clears throat> and, uh, and also, what size is it? So uh, we started working on that for a while uh, and I put it on the back burner because of all these other, we have such limited capacity because each person is doing 10 experiments and, and we always try to prioritize. We don't know what size it is. Our suspicions are that it's large. And so a lot of the plasmapheresis goes through filters of small size. You're trying to get rid of small molecules. There is some success with that, but it's pretty mixed. And I think the size of this is large. And uh, I think we have to figure out what it is, uh, what is the component. Uh, we have some of our suspicions of what it is, but it's not going to, it could be removed by those kind of treatments, but I don't think by the standard, because the standards are trying to remove antibodies. Some people have removed antibodies and say it improves things and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that it's, uh, it's generally done in a hospital. And the severe patients don't want to go to a hospital. Uh, they know from uh, all the um, social media that if you go to a hospital, you'll come back worse. And I've certainly seen a lot of examples of that. And uh, <clears throat> so they're scared to death to go to a hospital. Well, as a corollary to that, yes. do you think that uh, the infusion of certain immunoglobulins to block that whatever is in the serum uh, yeah, there is uh, uh, Dan Peterson, who was on the film, uh, does use uh, uh, what's called IVIG, uh, it, uh, um, where you put in a large amount of uh, uh, mixed uh, uh, immunoglobulins. Um, and you, it's not just one, you have to do it uh, uh, once a week for almost a year. <laughs> and then you do get some improvement for most patients. Uh, we tried that with our son, and after the eighth treatment, he said we had to stop. Um, and, and the problem is he's so much close to the edge that he can't take, and he, he just can't tolerate getting worse, or possibility of getting worse. Um, so we had to stop it. 
Um, but a lot of patients do report getting better, and they're starting to Dan Peterson. What is it doing? I have no idea. Um, uh, there's a lot of concern that there's a virus. Uh, we're pretty good at doing the technology to find that. Uh, we can't find, we can't find it. And uh, <clears throat> any virus should release its nucleic acid into the bloodstream because it's the sewer. And there's a lot of tests to do that. If you have a brain infection, uh, you see the, the DNA or RNA from the organism in the blood. If it's in the, in the heart, you see it in the blood and so forth. Uh, we've done extensive search for that um, in lots of different ways. And we don't find a, a, an organism. And, and, and these are pretty intensive efforts. And that is we take every sequence read that we get out of the patient and we scan it against every sequence that's ever been done in the entire world and look for a partial match. And we have to do that on hundreds of thousands of sequences. We got kicked off of the Stanford uh, uh, cluster computer because we were using it almost the entire time. And they wouldn't allow us to be on it anymore. Um, we now have access to other uh, big cluster computers that we use for that kind of a survey. But we've used other methods for looking for it as well. And if anything, the patients have less virus than healthy controls. Now that, I'm not sure that that's right. And so there's still things that we have to do uh, to tail that down, because I know a lot of patients don't believe that. Um, but the problem is I don't think people can experience a viral infection. I think they experience the body's reaction to the virus. And I think they get that reaction even though there's no virus. And they think they have a virus. That's relevant because if that's true, then maybe you shouldn't be taking antivirals. You should be taking something else that, that helps you better. This is all our current research. We don't know if it's right. Uh, we now plan to do a much more extensive look into that. So let me jump on that as well. As a clinician, uh, over the last 14 years of treating patients with ME-CFS, if you asked me if I had one treatment, what would I give them based on the experience that I've had? It would be antiviral medicines. That would be, in my anecdote, in my end of what I've seen, that has been our most effective treatment. Now, if you asked me what virus am I treating, I would shrug. I would say maybe Epstein-Barr, maybe HHV-6. That being said, I can't show you antibody results on all those patients. Now, that is not only based on my anecdote. There are studies from Stanford and other places. Do you, do you know Dr. Montoya? Yeah. Okay, so, so he's published extensively on using antiviral medicines for this uh, disorder. And, and, and I think any of us in, in practice would say that it's some, sometimes helpful and sometimes not, sometimes tolerable, sometimes not. Um, so you, you had brought up two other ideas, IgG can be infused also in a subcutaneous manner in a lower dose. We have lots of patients where we do that because they are homebound, so they don't have to go to a hospital. They can get skilled nursing care to come to the home for the first infusion and then go from there. We find a lot of our, of our um, uh, ME patients have low IgG levels, and if we show it twice, they can get insurance coverage for subcutaneous weekly IgG using Hyzantra, Gamagard, something like that. And some of them, it helps. Now, would I use that? Would I hold that out as a cure for uh, ME? Absolutely not. Plasmapheresis, I know, is uh, having sat at one of these um, uh, panels in Dartmouth, uh, sat along, one of my colleagues was uh, David Sistrom, who is an interventionist at the Brigham, and he mentioned uh, IVIG, he called it immunotherapy, which makes an allergist like me cringe because we, we call allergy shots immunotherapy, so they can't take our term. But, uh, <laughs> the, the, but, but he also talked about plasmapheresis. He talked about that this is really what they want to get to, but they have very little luck getting insurance Can to you cover. Can say what that is? What is plasmapheresis? So plasmapheresis is, is uh, exactly as, a, as the question mentioned, was, was sort of filtering out, filtering blood through a, through a machine, almost, almost similar to dialysis in a way. More specifics from that, I don't know that I can help with a little bit outside of my area of expertise, because I've never sat, I remember, in probably dates back to medical school time, the last time I recommended somebody for it, for TTP or something like that. But, but um, uh, it seems to me to be a very extreme treatment, and I don't know how many of our brittle patients would really be able to handle that. Uh, that being said, uh, someone's thinking. It's an idea. It's a strategy. It's, 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 it may be a way forward.
a number of times that it was mentioned, sorry, I'm probably just quiet, a um, number of times it was mentioned in this diagnosis of like anxiety or depression, very harmful misdiagnosis of those things. Um, and I'm wondering if y'all could speak to sort of where you see in your experience that misdiagnosis coming from, and I'm sure part of the answer was partly the kind of work that folks like you are already doing, but where you see that trend changing now in valuing patients' lived experiences and actually working on the disease as caregivers. I think we could probably all speak to that. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive in. Um, first of all, I just want to say that uh, anxiety and depression are very, very difficult diseases and conditions to live with. And by saying that ME is not that, is not uh, in any way disparaging or putting down these other uh, diseases and conditions. Um, and uh, I want to make reference to Cosmopolitan magazine. Uh, they just had a huge piece, a big feature, on um, a young woman who got mononucleosis in high school at 17 and was misdiagnosed as depression, was given every psychotropic drug you can think of on very high doses, and finally was given um, electric shock uh, treatment, uh, nine rounds of it. And each, she got progressively worse from it, and uh, finally she went to a psychiatrist who said, you know, maybe you, you know, have lingering effects of mono, and she was given other treatments, um, and she got better, significantly better. Um, I don't know why the disease got psychologized, but it feels, uh, from a patient's perspective, from my perspective, that it was almost a purposeful, dismissive um, strategy as a way to uh, get to avoid um, uh, research and insurance uh, claims. That's how it feels on my end. Um, and this, do I think that that's changing? Um, I think it only change, changes with this type of advocacy and, and when there's some research that comes out that will change, that, that can prove, you know, find a biomarker. Uh, but in the meantime, if you want to help us change this attitude so that patients get appropriately treated as opposed to this young woman that was featured in Cosmopolitan magazine, you would join an advocacy team like, like we have and you would help us lead these events. So um, at this point, advocacy and research that Ron's doing is what will turn that tide. And, and the NIH taking us seriously and treating the disease with the seriousness, seriousness and urgency that it deserves. Um, I've been told by, I can't even count how many people, um, no biomarker, no treatment, no disease. And um, I've had so many people tell me that about my brother, which makes me want to punch them in the face. Um, but I don't know where that idea came from, because every single disease known to man started with no biomarker and no treatment. So why would this one be any different? And if you read any history book about medicine, every single disease started out not being believed. So it, it's just funny to see, I mean, not funny, haha, -ha, but um, history repeat, repeat itself like that. And I think people hear the word fatigue, and they just think, oh, they're tired a lot. That's a sign of depression. Go see a therapist. And they, they just stop listening after that point. Um, a lot of the severe patients are only believed when they become bedbound and, you know, like my brother, and he can't eat. I mean, clearly, he's not depressed. You know, depressed people eat. <laughs> um, and so, you know, more moderate or mild patients are often never believed. Um, and I, I think it's, it, the name is very harmful in itself, so. Medicine is, uh, as we practice it, as I learned it, as we practice it, I think I'm reformed a little bit, but is, um, is a diagnose and treat. So that is your job, is you evaluate the data that's coming in from the present, from the presence of the patient sitting across the table from you. Your goal is to collect that data, use your experience and expertise and knowledge and whatever, and give a diagnosis. That's it. 
and then you go laterally to that. Once you've made that diagnosis, you come up with your treatment. So there's no further thinking once you've made your diagnosis, you have your treatment. So first visit, patient comes in, you say, well, I'm not sure, let's do some testing, I'm not sure what the diagnosis is. Run your tests, nothing comes back. Hmm, you know what, I didn't look at a couple of other things. Let me run those tests next time. So it's done, you run them, hmm, can't think of something. You know, but you said you had, you said you were sick a couple of years ago. I know, I'll send you to an infectious disease doctor. You see them, they run their tests, what do you get? Maybe nothing back. Hmm, frustrating, ID doctor says, I don't think I can help this person, see? You know what, they did complain of pain, maybe a rheumatologist. Next set of tests, done, gone. Uh, what do you see? Maybe all normal. What happens? Frustration. You, have, you as a physician want to solve problems. You are met by a problem that cannot be solved. The problem is not so much the patient, it's the physician. Of not knowing enough and not thinking widely enough. Of not trusting that that person is actually still presenting that part of the problem is your own problem and getting over your own ego and the fact that you cannot solve everything. What happens in medicine all too often is when you can't fix it, it's psych. If I can't decide what it is medically, it's psych. And if you look at, at the overlap of symptoms that can go along with, with anxiety disorders or depressive disorders, some of them overlap with, there is some overlap of symptoms. So it's the lazy diagnosis. It's the just channel them to most astute, Psychiatrists will see those patients once and kick them right back and say, no way, do your job, keep looking at this, this is medical. But some of them don't, as Rivka was saying, you know, we, some of them just get carried away and oh, this must be really hard to treat, depressive conversion disorder, something, let's get more extreme with treatments. I've seen both. Uh, it's sad. Uh, it's sad that my colleagues in medicine sort of quit and it's sad that labels inappropriately are applied just because you can't crack the code. Can you talk a little louder? It's hard to hear you. Uh, one of my daughters, my eight old daughter, uh, was 28 when she died of what sadly tolerance, secondary diseases, was actually on her death certificate. Um, I had just sent her your name to David. She was working at Stanford in the intensive care unit. Um, so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so very, very sorry. Could you be sure to come down and speak to me when, when this is over? Okay, yeah, but I'd like to talk. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And th uh, thank you for sharing that story. It's, it's tra there are so many, so many tragic stories with this disease. I think there's someone in the back. Yeah.
There are two questions there. One is, what is the, the, is, the timeline for uh, testing this metabolic trap? Um, uh, well, I can answer that one first. And then, um, um, of course, we don't know, because what we're trying to do is prove it's not correct. And uh, what you're, this is a kind of a, this is how you do science, and it's kind of ironic, because uh, what, you, what you're hoping for is constant failure. Um, because if you fail to prove it, uh, it's wrong, then you've succeeded. So you're, you're uh, but, but you have, to, then you think of another way to test it, and you have to try another test. So it's a little difficult. Uh, however, we're really focused on trying to come up with a treatment or uh, a possible cure. And uh, we were lucky enough in the Bay Area to have quite a large number of doctors that specialize in this. They're not, they're not so rare, and so um, and they're uh, willing to try things. So if we th we get far enough along that it looks that we really do fail to show it's uh, wrong, uh, and we have some ideas of how to, we might treat it, uh, we will try those. As long as it's under doctor supervision and we, we and what we're doing is not likely to harm them. Um, and that's, a, and that's a, a, another way to test the ideas. So we're already working on one uh, and, and trying to locate the equipment for doing that. And uh, I, I, I think David Coffin will run that. If not, we'll find another physician around Stanford to do it. Um, but so it's, we're trying to make this as fast as possible, but it's complicated. And we keep coming up with uh, discovering uh, new problems, why we can't, why the tests are invalid. And uh, that, that's really frustrating. Um, uh, the other, uh, I mean, of course, one of the things we just found was one of our patients we were testing uh, didn't look like it was going to show the right evidence, and we kind of got depressed about it. And then in talking to the doctor, the doctor said, well, yeah, I tested them. I don't think they have chronic fatigue syndrome. So we get those kinds of problems. There's not a good diagnosis. We take a sample, a patient sample, and run tests on it, and if they don't have the disease, of course it's going to fail. Uh, the other question was IVIG. Um, that's probably worth trying. We're currently doing that with uh, 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 other t compounds. The, the difficulty we have with that one is that it takes uh, months and months of that treatment to have the effect. So that we will test it, but it's not high on the list because uh, we give it an hour. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have two other uh, drugs that show uh, an effect on this test, and, and those are going to get pursued uh, more aggressively. That's great, Dr. Davis. Thank you. My friend Eddie says thank you. Uh, those are probably not going to cure the patients, but they might be an effective treatment. Uh, we also have another of testing that uh, we're suspicious of, of deficiencies in the patients that will be easy to supplement, and we just want to make sure it's right. In fact, the supplements can be bought over the counter in any uh, pharmacy. And as far as we can tell, no one's ever tried it. I, in talking to some of the other physicians, I think that might be somewhat common in some of the herpes viral infections. Because oh. um, uh, at one point, my son had some open sore, and the doctor looked at it and said, oh, that could be a herpes infection. Uh, I don't, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to tell you. But um, uh, the, the patients experience such a parathra of just very uncommon things that is not common in other patients, and I don't know exactly why. My guess is that it's, uh, 
It's systemic disease and it has to do with where their vulnerabilities are. None of us are, are identical, in spite of politics saying we should be the same. Uh, we're not. <laughs> and everybody in the world is unique. And that's, which I think is wonderful. And that's, that, and that's genetics. <laughs> So herpes viruses, as we all know, can stay dormant for years and then they can yeah. get resurrected and... Yeah, we didn't, we're glad we didn't know that once you've had this illness, if you get better, it can come back anytime. She had 20 wonderful years and we are so glad we didn't know that. Um, some people probably don't know that, but uh, these, these herpes viruses like Epstein virus virus and HHV6, almost everybody has them. Uh, there's another virus that we look at as actually it's a control. It's called a TT virus. Everybody has them, and they get them right after birth. And uh, we, n nobody has any idea if they do something bad or not because we don't have anybody that doesn't have them. <laughs> and so uh, the viruses are very common, and uh, and they do and they can get reactivated. I just want to say, I know we're running later, um, and so the film, when we show the rest of it, will go long, but I don't, I don't want to lose the opportunity to have these questions with Dr. Davis and Dr. Lynch, so I just, I recognize some of you might be getting a little antsy about the film, but I'd rather have the opportunity for people to have questions, so I hope that's all right with the audience. Um, I know you've had your hand up a couple of times. And then, uh, again, you know, I, my daughter, who went to school at uh, Mahoyo, So in our patient population, I would say that, that uh, candida is sometimes a player in MECFS. Not, in my opinion, as the primary infectious issue or post-infectious issue, but as downstream, as, a, as a something beat up the immune system, something affected the B cells, T cells, so that the body is no longer as resilient against common intruders as it once was. So then, uh, other uh, less pathologic agents, I would say, candida would fit into that realm, could be more problematic. One of the places you can look for candida, if you believe this, and I do, but maybe you guys are with me on this, is, is in, you can look for it in, in culture, in, in stool. And if it grows to a significant amount, to me that is probably pathologic. If it's a little bit there, sometimes harder to make, an, make, a, make, make gravy out of it. But if you see it and somebody is sick and you treat it, you'd be surprised at how many people move the needle a little bit. And I wouldn't hold that to be necessarily curative, but, but we, in, in my field anyway, in integrative medicine, are big buyers that, that fungal dysbiosis and fungal overgrowth is real and important to treat. Uh, I don't know that I would list it in my top five 
most beneficial treatments for ME-CFS, but as Dr. Davis mentioned, you gotta treat the individuals here more than the title of the illness. So in your analysis, if that's something that comes up, and we do a lot of stool testing in these ill patients just to see what the ecology looks like within their biome, within their gut, to the degree that we can do that, acknowledging that our tools are by far less advanced than we would hope they would be. That being said, whatever data we can, call, we can gather from that person to offer something to treat. So that being said, there are lots of things that can kill yeast. So you don't necessarily have to use prescriptive agents, but there are some good ones. Nystatin works. Fluconazole, which is more potent, more systemic, works. But there are herbals as well, grapefruit seed extract, oregano, garlic, uh, olive leaf extract, uh, berberine. I mean, there are many things that can kill yeast, so whatever works. Uh, and, the, and, the, and that is tolerable to somebody. Now, what we see sometimes with candida is you're in it. It is a slog. You're not expecting to be in and out on, in a week or two as you would with, let's say, an antibiotic for an acute infection. You're planning on months, at least in my experience, months of treatment. Uh, and you may see die-off or worsening of symptoms or an exaggeration of their syndrome before they start getting better. Um, I could add a little bit to that, that question, and that is uh, I strongly believe uh, people should get tested for things, and if it knows tests, that we should develop one uh, and not guess as to what's wrong and try to treat a guess, which I think a lot of the patients do. So, uh, for example, it's known that fish oil is supposed to be good for you, uh, and, and it is. And that fish oil has uh, uh, oil in it called omega-3. Uh, the body actually will preferentially use omega-3. It's all geared up that you won't get very much. And then we look at the metabolomics of patients, there's an abundance of omega-3 products in, in the blood. Um, and when we know that they're taking, either eating a lot of fish or they're taking supplements, but there's another oil that's also important, and that's omega-6. Uh, in many, many patients, it's almost undetectable, and it's way too low. There's too many critical things are made from omega-6 that the patients probably can't do because they think if a little fish oil is good, a lot is better. And that's a thing you have to learn. If a little is good, more is not necessarily better. It may actually be worse. And the best thing to do is get tests and treat when you know the test. And that needs to be probably done under doctor's supervision if you could find one. Uh, but, uh, 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 and it's a problem. But I know, for example, a lot of patients think that they are, have heavy metals and they do chelation therapy and all that sort of thing. Well, we can detect that too because we know that, because the, it doesn't just remove the bad metals, it removes the good ones. <laughs> And some patients are very deficient in the metals that are absolutely essential. And there's no trace of toxic metals. So it, they're guessing. And I understand why they have to guess and try, but they're probably making their situation worse. And uh, because these kind of treatments are just uh, with no effect. They have effects. And if it's the wrong one, you can make yourself even much, much worse. Is that reasonable? You're the physician.
how much I do. Um, I guess my question is, can I continue to exercise in order to cope with anxiety, even if it makes me feel sick afterwards? Uh, or is that a terrible idea? I've been trying to ask <laughs> So you're not worsening with your current exercise program. You wouldn't say, compared to six months, a year, 18 months ago, that you're declining as a result of your no, exercise I program. I wouldn't say that. And, also, and you're getting ongoing benefit, at least from an anxiety standpoint, from it. Yes, I, I do get benefit. It'd be hard to talk you out of it. <laughs> yeah. Then I wouldn't, right? So, so if you if if you were falling apart in front of my eyes, but insistent that you needed to exercise, that's an easy decision, right? But but you're not. So so I and and to take something away from someone that is so meaningful to them, who has already given up a lot in their life, is very difficult as a physician to orchestrate. So I would never. So I think. The, the tightrope that you're walking here is a very fine one, though, right? right? You, because if you way overdo it, then boy, your, your, your payback becomes even more so. Now, are you, I, I think I'm going to gather that part of your other question is you're doing more damage. And the answer is I don't think anyone can, can tell you that, right? So I don't, I don't know that you, you didn't exercise yourself into ME in the first place. So I don't know that you can... It, it, it crescendo the illness with, with the exercise because you're tolerating it, because you're still at the same status point. So I, I wouldn't. I don't think that you're doing yourself any, any harm with that. Uh, I wish I had something that could help for uh, PEM, uh, uh, and I don't. Uh, we, well, that's, there are some things we try. Uh, sometimes we try mitochondrial supporters, things like ribose, things like carnitine, uh, I don't know if these are things you've tried before, CoQ10, B vitamins, any of these mitochondrial supporters. I know there, there are uh, some in the uh, MECFS community, uh, physicians who do a lot with mitochondrial resuscitation, they call it. They give these, these, uh, these, are, these are molecules that are in the you know, mitochondria that are in, involved in energy production, starting with ribose, which is your raw material, then you run it through mitochondria, you throw NAD and B vitamins and CoQ10 at it. So you can supplement with each of those, and anecdotally, sometimes it helps. There are also studies in non-related illnesses like cardiomyopathy or, or myo myopathy, which show that, that these kind of treatments can sometimes offer some benefit. I'll add uh, one thing to that, which is that the disease, um, it, for some people, it's progressive. So some people will, be, will progressively get worse, and for some people, it's not progressive. And some people, you know, a few fair, a, a small number improve. So for 15 years, I was able to go on walks. And then um, I had a real stressor in my life, um, and uh, everything sort of imploded, and I stopped being able to walk. And so uh, just be careful. You know, the last thing, the one thing, I, you know, I don't think we've stressed this enough. If you get diagnosed with this disease or you think you have this disease, you do not want to push yourself physically or emotionally or intellectually, uh, you, cognitively, you do not want to push because that's when it will get worse. So if you are at this place where you are on a balancing act where you can do this exercise but you're not pushing yourself, then I, I would sort of concur, but Ron? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, I, I, I had a graduate student that uh, came down with the disease at the same time my son did, and I was uh, expecting the medical community to figure out and cure them. <laughs> it took me a while to realize that was not going to happen, um, but we started doing a lot of tests on her as well. All her tests came out almost identical to my son's. Uh, she uh, was working on a PhD. Uh, she left the lab and was gone for about seven years. Um, and then uh, she progressively got better and managed to get her PhD. All she had to do was write it up. But now she says she's completely cured. And of course, I challenge that. And she says, I can run 10 miles a day and not have an effect. And to me, that's a definition of cured. Yeah. 
Um, and I said, how did you do that? And she said, I totally paced myself and I never crashed for like a year or two. And so that creates a hypothesis that one thing that keeps them trapped in this disease is virtually all the patients will do something that makes them crash. And it might reinitiate the disease. And then you have to wait another year. So I don't know if that's right or not, but there's so few people that are cured. It's, uh, I'm trying to find other people that say they're cured. What did they do? Uh, right, so she's a smart lady and very, uh, very, very competent scientist. So I, I give it a lot of weight. I, th I think we can't, um, we can't, un we can't overemphasize what what Ron is saying. It, uh, so if, if if you are a patient, you are supposed to be pacing yourself, which means you uh, don't let your heart rate get above where it should be, and you should be taking it easy. Um, you should not be pushing yourself. Do you want to say anything more about pacing? No. Okay. We're, we're going to try to uh, set up a collaboration with Mike Snyder. We're going to try to develop a wearable device uh, that will tell you when you've reached your limit. Oh, wow. And I think we might be able to do that from heart rates and heart rate variability and body temperature, and we'll measure all those things. Uh, he, he was successful in getting that to predict a, um, uh, um, it was a diabetic, uh, uh, going into a diabetic crisis. And um, so uh, it, it, it's likely that we could, he thinks we can do that. So that will be on the development stage for uh, in, the, in the coming future. Because I think that would help the patients a lot if you get a, a notice from your watch saying enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other part of my question just had to do with the fact that I, I no longer have anyone treating me. Um, I'm just doing this on my own. And uh, I, I was on Valsite and Valtrex for a long time. I, I don't know how, two, two years or something. Um, Dr. Lynch. <laughs> so there, there are probably some other areas to, so I, I wouldn't consider, um, you know, just a, just a trial of antiviral and maybe some improvement to sort of an end of the line. Uh, as we, you know, when I showed the slide, you know, one of the major symptoms that goes along, and I wonder if it's something that's holding you back is, I mean, have you been screened for POTS? Has anyone done a tilt table test? Have you had any sort of, uh, hemodynamic sort of investigation into your circulation as they, as they're, do, you know, there's a few uh, places that I send people. One of them is to the Brigham, to David Sistrom, to have uh, evaluation done to make sure cardiovascularly that there's not things that can, that can be done to help. Uh, we, we uh, at, in my office, we were able to do intravenous treatments, so we give people uh, fluids, not uncommonly, who, who have uh, issues with POTS and orthostasis. So I, I think there's more work to potentially do here it depends on you and you know you're obviously living with this and but it's at a at a it doesn't seem like at a functional capacity that you're yet happy with so so it, you know I, and I'm not saying that that me, myself or anyone could help any further than you are right that would be overly optimistic but I would also say that what well, well, I wouldn't quit like I don't think that that would be a line I would draw okay. Thank you. Uh, my son was on uh, IV valsite for a year and a half and um, he did say it made him feel a little better. Uh, but one of his physicians was uh, Robert Navio, who was at University of California, San Diego, who's a mitochondrial specialist. Um, and when he was one, in one of his studies, um, he urged us to take him off the bowel site. And the reason for that is he said that these drugs are what's called DNA replication analogs that uh, are incorporated by the virus, and it kills the virus because it makes lots of mutations. He said, I, I would worry in, in a long-term treatment that the mitochondria might get damaged as well because it doesn't have a very sophisticated replication system. The human cells are quite uh, capable of getting rid of it and not incorporating it. 
that mitochondria are not. And now that's just speculation, uh, but it, he has said it was something that you probably should not take long, long term. Uh, and the other thing to, re, uh, to recognize is some evidence that these, uh, these drugs are anti-inflammatories. The thing about uh, drugs is the fact that they don't do one thing. Uh, they're called side effects, but in fact what it is is they do other things. They bind to other things, they carry out other operations, which in fact can make you feel not so well. Uh, but they also can do good things. And, and it's possible that some of these drugs are just anti-inflammatories, and if you took an anti a real anti-inflammatory, you might even feel better. So uh, uh, it's a problem. And, and uh, if you take something like Valsite and it makes you feel better, that's not a test that you have virus. So I would urge people to do virus DNA testing for these viruses. If you have them, take the drugs. In my son's case, we could not detect the virus at all uh, for a long period of time. However, his antibodies to HHV6 and, and EBV is extremely high. Those antibodies are higher than anything else in his body in terms of reaction. It's, it's a mystery. And, we, and yet we cannot detect the virus and we've tested them over and over again with lots of different methodology that we've developed. So uh, it, having the antibody doesn't mean you have the virus. It means Did you. Did they ever go down the antibodies after being on the antiviral? Yeah, I'm sorry, what? Did his viral antibodies ever go down after being on the antiviral? No. M mine did on being on the antivirals, and symptomatically, I was the same. I was not better, but I, I. Uh, other times, I was symptomatically better on the antivirals. It's, it's just. It's just a wild goose chase. That's what it feels like as, as the patient. But other people get solid help consistently from something like low-dose naltrexone. Um, I can't tolerate it at all. I can't tolerate a tiny even drop of it. Um, yeah. So for the new, uh, the one, one therapy we're, we're just starting to look at uh, are peptides. I don't know, Dr. Davis, have you, have you had anyone who's peptides. interested in it? Alpha thymosin one, oh. thymosin alpha one. Have you had any experience with that in patients? No, I, we tested that in my son. It, it, it's not an issue for him. Okay, so that this is a, a, a sort of a novel approach of not using a medicine, but a but a a, a, a chain of uh, synthetically produced amino acids to sort of try and drive a an immune process, and and uh, we're. We'll let you know. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that we're just uh, just embarking on considering. It's an injectable, so that's not an easy. Uh, it won't be easy for patients. The the price tag on it doesn't seem too low. It's not something we're going to get insurance coverage for, but uh, well, that's probably our next area of uh, looking. Um. You, you have my permission to say, send a nasty letter to NIH? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we've got that big... Uh, we we do need to get the public seven. behind this, and, and, and NIH won't respond to the scientists or the, uh, or the patients, right. but they will respond to the public, well, if it's enough. Well, I'm not a patient, but I'm a patient. Right, person. but it's, it, it's going to be thousands of people. Uh, well, uh, they have the petition of 7,000 people, and I understand that he barely looked at it. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Right. Okay. It's, so it's then, not. It's not an, not enough. <laughs> money, like, you know. Well, uh, so uh, Linda Tannenbaum and I kind of joined forces. She was trying to raise money. I was trying to do research, and I said I don't know anything about fundraising. And she says I don't know anything about research. So let's get together. Um, 
So uh, it, I, I recommend that at the moment just because she parks the money there. But Where are we talking about? Open Medicine Foundation. And it, all of it goes to research. And um, if you give it to me, then it, it's going to go all the research too, but it's going to be uh, stuck at Stanford, um, which is fine because Stanford's not a bad place. Uh, and I can actually fund other graduate students that work for other faculty, but I can't give it away to somebody else, like Robert Navio. But if it goes to Open Medicine Foundation, uh, we have a board, and that board decides where the money goes. Uh, and so that's a way to. Uh, uh, try to give it out to, uh, and we don't accept grants because uh, this is not the way NIH works. It, 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 we have to target it, and we look at uh, people who are very, very good at research, and we know that that problem needs to be dealt with, and then we try to induce them to do it. The problem is all the good researchers have lots of projects. <laughs> they aren't going to jump on this on their own. Uh, we have to induce them to do it. We have to first beg. <laughs> And, and so forth. And we've managed to keep growing and getting new people all over the world to start doing research that are really good researchers. So uh, again, the Open Medicine Foundation is where you should be writing your checks, and that will fund um, Ron Davis's work as well as other good scientists. But also, I want to just mention that if you do want to help with advocacy and you cannot volunteer, advocacy needs donations also. We can't run on, on no money. Uh, so if you want to help with advocacy, there's wonderful organizations, including the Massachusetts ME, CFS, and FM Association, and there's also ME Action and uh, Solve ME CFS, which does advocacy and uh, research, and then there's AMES, A-M-M-E-S dot org. So there's really good organizations out there that desperately need um, human power and dollars. I'm going to do one last question up here in the purple, and then we'll, yes, <laughs> and then we'll do the film, okay? Because I do have staff that's waiting to also end as well. Well, one thing just to confirm a quick question Absolutely. with the Open Medicine Foundation, um, <coughs> being housebound and stuff, um, with Amazon, they can do Amazon smiles. You can go to Open Medicine Foundation, so whenever you buy something, a little bit goes there. Excellent. And then there's a website called Humble Bundle. Where you can buy packs of games, books, and everything, and you can have a certain percentage go to charities. And one of the charities on the website, and there's over like 300, um, is the Open Medicine Foundation. Thank you. And um, my question is recently, there's been a lot of talk and like, uh, you know, research about small fiber neuropathy. So I have lots of patients who I send to uh, um, for help for POTS, and a lot of them get biopsies from their uh, experts, and, and most of them come back with a small fiber neuropathy. I wish I knew what to do at that point. Uh, I don't know how that helps necessarily. Maybe Dr. Davis from a more micro standpoint could help explain that. But to me, I don't know yet. I, I wonder what I, when, when people ask me that, it's like, okay, now I have small fiber neuropathy. What do you got? Uh, I, you know, my, I was, oh, not again. You know, another diagnosis. I don't know that <laughs> patients need more diagnoses. I think they need more treatments. So, um, but what I wonder is if it's coming. I, I wonder if now that you're getting this, this, this pile of patients new with this relatively, to me, new diagnosis, and you know, is that going to then propel treatments? Because what, in my experience, when new diagnoses come up, uh, pharmaceutical industry sniffs around and says, oh, small fiber neuropathy. What, what can we do? We, get, we can get something for that. So I, I wonder if, it, if, if the group of you all will lead to more. Like right now, it just seems to be, to me, data. I don't know that it, it gives me much insight, me, into the illness itself, because I already know there's neurologic and autonomic dysfunction. Um, so I, I'm st I guess I'm waiting to see where that will help specifically. 
Yeah, yeah I'd, I would agree with that. Uh, uh, David Kaufman does it on all his patients, uh, and he uses that to do some of his treatments and so forth. Uh, but nothing really goes with that in terms of a database, so we decided that we would get together with him and collect a blood sample from all those patients as well uh, that he, that, uh, and, and record them as positive or negative and then see if we can find a connection somewhere else. Uh, it just adds to what we're doing, it's just one other data point, uh, but we might find a connection and sometimes those connections might actually realize that there's a pathway in the person that seems to be very co closely correlated with it that then may suggest a, a particular treatment. So we, we come up with potential treatments quite frequently. Uh, it just needs a doctor to try it out. Um, uh, but that's sort of the game here, to try to find something that makes a connection. Well, thank, thank the panel so much. And thank you guys for all your wonderful questions. <laughs>